We have another vintage calculator to look at today. This time round it's a Munro 620, made in Japan around 1972, and it has one very special feature – a Nixie tube display. I'd wanted something with Nixie tubes for several years, but most of the calculators that came up on eBay were at silly prices that I wasn't prepared to pay. Then this rather wrecked Munro popped up at a slightly more reasonable price, so I figured I'd place a bid. And my bid won. So when my kit of parts arrived, it was time to take a look at what I'd actually got. I didn't film that much of the cleanup and repair, so the video may appear a bit disjointed in places, but you can see from these shots that the case was smashed in several places, the whole calculator was filthy, with decomposed foam all over the keyboard, and there was no guarantee that it would work at all. The first job was to carefully clean up all the insides of the calculator, without creating static that could zap one of the chips. From the state the calculator was in, there was no way I was just going to apply power without carefully checking the power supply, so I removed that and cleaned it separately. And now I've got the power supply cleaned up, we can take a quick look at things. Power comes in and passes through two inductors here and here, and there are capacitors to ground from each side. Ideally these should be replaced with class Y capacitors, which, if they fail, will fail open circuit. I might replace these at some point, but I'll think about that later. The middle section of the board handles the logic voltage, with the bridge rectifier diodes in the centre here. And finally, the high voltage for the Nixie tubes is handled over on the right hand side, and you can see this fried 2.7k resistor over here, so something has been drawing too much current. It could be a fault on the main board, or it could be as simple as a dodgy capacitor on this board that's acting more like a resistor. If so, it'll be this one. So I'll pluck out a few components and test them to see what we can find. I ended up taking all the capacitors out to check them, and most of them were way off their specified value. For instance, the one in the circuit with the fried resistor is marked as 1 microfarad, but it reads nearly 2 microfarads, which isn't a great sign. Bizarrely enough, the fried resistor, although it has clearly been overheating, was spot on 2.7k. Anyway, I've replaced all the capacitors, including the two going to ground, that now have Class Y safety capacitors fitted. And that's the last one soldered back in. And it goes without saying that I've replaced the fried resistor over here too. After that I checked the logic voltages, which were more or less correct, at minus 8 and minus 15 volts. So the next thing to do is to actually try the calculator out. I've assembled just enough to be able to test everything, but be careful, there's a lot of voltage floating around in these calculators. There's full mains voltage going to the power supply and the two neon warning lights, then something like 100 to 150 volts going to the Nixie tubes, so don't meddle if you're not sure what you're doing. Out of shot I've got my very basic, current limiting switched power block that I use when testing all electrical stuff like this. It has an old filament bulb in series with the load, and I can swap the bulb to allow more or less current to flow. If the unit I'm testing is drawing too much current, or has a dead short, the bulb will glow, limiting the current to the device. It has a switched socket, so I can turn the device on and off without going anywhere near it, and a bulb bypass switch if I want to apply full power to the device under test. And finally, a more recent addition was this power meter, which can display voltage, what's being drawn, frequency, the current being drawn, and the power factor. So now for the big moment. Will it work, or will it explode? Ooh, now that's pretty. I wonder if it'll respond to the keyboard. It's looking good. And that's all 13 digits working. I guess I could try some addition. If this works, we should get the result of 3330. And that's also good. I suppose I'd better do some work on the case and get the thing put back together, rather than just playing with it, tempting as it is to carry on using it now.
Repairing the case was another section that I didn't film, but there were quite a few fragments of broken case that arrived with the calculator, so I was able to piece those back together using plastic weld, which is fantastic stuff, so long as you use it on the correct sorts of plastic. For the sections where a piece was missing, I bonded in some plasticard as backing before filling the area with epoxy based filler. And for the corner of the display surround, I reconstructed that entirely out of plasticard. I'm not planning to fill the cracks because then I'll need to paint the entire keyboard cover, which just won't look right, and it won't match the keys either. I will at some point in time touch in the non-matching areas such as the plasticard section and attempt to blend it to look like the surrounding plastic, but I'd rather have a battle-worn working calculator than a pristine non-functional museum piece. At the rear of the calculator I plastic welded the crack back together and used plasticard to back up the missing section before filling it with epoxy filler. Again I'll touch that area up at some time. Finally, there was no power lead with the calculator, I'd just rigged up some leads for the test run, but I needed a plug, so I designed and 3D printed one. It probably wouldn't meet current safety standards, but it's actually pretty good. The earth pin protrudes to the end of the plug, while the live and neutral are shorter, so you can't touch them. So I got everything back together and started trying the calculator out. Everything was good for about half an hour, until lots of the keys stopped working and others seemed to be performing the wrong operation. I took the machine apart again, suspecting an issue with the keyboard matrix or the wires connecting it to the main board. I examined everything carefully and checked the continuity of the wires. Everything seemed fine, so I tried it again and it was working. A day or so later I was using the calculator and it started playing up again. This time I made a note of what was and wasn't working. All of the number keys worked, but various other keys didn't. For instance, memory plus entered a zero and minus equals performed a backspace. Yet again I took the machine apart to check everything, and unlike the Hitachi that I repaired recently, this machine is pretty horrible to work on, nowhere near as well laid out. Anyway, this time I went to the effort of drawing out the keyboard circuit diagram, which took an absolute age, and please don't judge me on my terrible circuit diagrams. Once this was drawn up, it was crystal clear that the fault was somewhere on line KF4. If we look at memory plus, it connects KF4 and KF2 to ground. And then look at zero, this key simply connects KF2 to ground. So if line KF4 is out of operation, memory plus will enter a zero, which is what it did, and this was confirmed looking at other faulty keys too. So I removed and checked the wire between the mainboard and the keyboard for KF4, and then resoldered it back in place. I checked the tracks from that wire back to the chip, and then I turned my attention to these two wires on the keyboard PCB where the track swap sides. This PCB doesn't have through plated holes, instead they just solder a plug through the board, and although it looked fine, I suspect there was a dry joint, because since resoldering that I haven't had any more trouble with the calculator. So finally it's time to see what this calculator does. Most of it is pretty standard, but it does have a few quirks. Clearly these machines don't have leading zero suppression, so all the digits are always illuminated which isn't a problem because they're just so pretty. There's no floating point, and unlike many machines you can't cheat it to show extra decimal places. For instance, on many machines if I enter 355 divided by 113 and then hit the times key, it will show all the decimal places because it's in mid-calculation. But as you can see we've just got the answer of 3 because I've currently got the calculator set to 0 decimal places. If I move the knob to two decimal places, and enter 12, and press plus, it displays the result as 12.00, which is normal for fixed point mode. The same can be said if I enter 12.99 and press plus, we get the expected answer of 24.99. But if I now enter 12.975, the overflow light comes on because we've overflowed the decimal places by entering three numbers after the decimal point. 
Another quirky thing with the decimals is, if I enter 12.99 again, then press the decimal point, it moves to the end of the line, so I can enter two more digits. And I can keep doing this until the register eventually overflows with more than 13 digits. The maximum number of decimal places is 6. So if I again divide 355 by 113 and press equals, we get the answer of 3.141593. And that's as accurate as it gets. And that's with the rounding switch set to the standard 5-4 position, where numbers of 5 and over are rounded up and the rest are rounded down. If I set that switch to the round down position and repeat 355 divided by 113 and press equals, this time we get the result as 3.141592. The seventh decimal being 9 means that rounding up to the 3 gives us a more accurate result. The backspace key allows you to delete an entry one digit at a time, just like that. And the CD key clears the current display, but not the entire calculation. So if you make a mistake partway through a long calculation, you can just clear that entry and carry on, rather than using the clear key and starting over again. The RV key reverses the X and Y registers. So, if I want to divide 207,402,312 by 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5 plus 4, I enter the 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5 plus 4, and not forgetting the final plus to enter the 4, then press the divide key, and then enter the 207,402,312, and press the RV key to swap the two registers, then press equals, we get the answer of 5,318,008 showing in the register. Ooh, I say. The K key latches down, allowing us to perform calculations using a constant multiplier or divisor. So if I'm converting from feet into metres, I can enter 0.3048 times, let's say 15 feet, and press equals to get the answer 4.572 metres. Then I can repeat that with another distance, we'll go for 30 feet, and press equals to get the answer of 9.144 metres. The same works for division. Say I'm converting pounds sterling into US dollars. I can enter an amount of 34 pounds and 86 pence, divided by the current exchange rate at 0.83, and press equals to reveal the answer of 42 dollars. Then to do another conversion, I just have to enter the amount in pounds and press equals. We'll go for 552 pounds and 78 pence and press equals to get the answer of 666 dollars. I can also accumulate the results of normal or constant multiplication and division calculations into the memory by using the memory plus equals key over here. So, if I enter 19,920 pounds divided by 0.83, followed by memory plus equals, then 39,840 pounds followed by memory plus equals, then 23,240 pounds followed by memory plus equals, and finally 838 pounds and 30 pence followed by memory plus equals. And now I can reveal the sum of that lot by pressing the memory subtotal or total keys, giving us the answer of $101,010. The two memory keys are much the same as most old adding machines. Memory subtotal displays the contents of the memory, but leaves that value in the memory, whereas pressing memory total displays the contents of the memory, clearing it in the process. So if I press it again, we just get zero. Negative values are shown with a minus sign that appears over on the left hand side of the display. So if I enter 1 and press plus equals, followed by 3 and minus equals, we get the answer of 2 with the minus sign illuminated. If I now add 2 to that, the minus sign remains illuminated even though the result is now 0. Adding a positive value again clears the minus sign. And lastly, before we take a closer look at the Nixie tubes, what happens if I divide by zero? So I'll add 1 into the register, 
Then press the divide key followed by zero and press equals. And not a lot happens, apart from the decimal point moves one place to the left. And if I carry on entering numbers, the decimal place moves left as the numbers are entered. Not that you can do anything with that, because pressing another operation like times causes an overflow. So the next thing to do is to open the machine up and take a closer look at those beautiful Nixie tubes. And while we're inside, you might notice the name Canon on all the circuit boards, because this machine is in fact a Canon that was made for Monroe, and all the chips are from Texas Instruments. The basic way a Nixie tube works is, you have a sealed glass tube with some low pressure gas inside, such as neon. Within the tube is a metal mesh which forms the anode, and ten digits stacked one in front of the other that form the cathodes. Hopefully if I get this shot right, you'll be able to see the mesh in front of the digits. Applying a voltage of 100 volts or so to one of the cathodes forms a glowing gas discharge around that digit. If I go through the ten available digits, you should see that some are clearer than others, because they are nearer to the front of the stack. If I go for a more side-on shot, this will be even clearer, with the number 6 being at the front of the stack on these particular tubes. There's something rather hypnotic about staring into a Nixie tube display, a bit like looking into an infinity mirror or that kind of thing. If you want to see more Nixie tubes, I'll leave a link in the description to Dalibor Farney's channel, where you can see how he makes brand new Nixie tubes in the Czech Republic. Anyway, that probably covers it for this calculator, and the video has probably gone on far longer than planned. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video, and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when future videos are released. That's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.